playing for Bob Cousy, for you young people today, was like playing for LeBron James, or on the women's side, Diana Taurasi. No offense given to you, Coach Lydon, or you, Coach Duran. Not taken. <laughs> Good to hear. For many of you who are young in this audience, the question is, who is Bob Cousy? Who is Bill Russell? When you go to the TD Garden, look up at those banners where those retired numbers are. There is a story for every number. Okay, so some of you here might remember what I'm about to describe. For those of you who don't, I want you to picture this. Opposing shooter takes a shot and misses. And there is Russell, rising, rising for the rebound. He's long, lean, and springy, nearly six foot 10. He wears Celtic jersey number six. And still airborne, he half turns and snaps that outlet pass, even before the converse high tops have hit the floor. There is Bob Cousy. Pass comes to him. Now, Cousy has an odd shape to his body. It looks like it's been put together by two architects with competing visions. His lower half is thick, thick buttocks, thick thighs. The lower half of a longshoreman or wrestler. The upper half, completely different. No chest to speak of, no shoulders, no muscles on his arms, arms thin as pipes. The upper body seems to belong to a bank clerk. But he's the Houdini of the hardwood from Holy Cross. Fancy dribbler, fancier passer. And now he turns. And as he turns to face the front court, he takes that photograph in his mind's eye. He detects movements, swatches of colors. He calls it the gift of peripheral vision. People will say, Kuz, you got eyes in the back of your head. But it's not Houdini's eyes that excel. It's brain capacity. Studies have shown this. It's his ability to interpret patterns and react to them on the fly. So now Cousy dribbles into the front court. In basketball, you've got to know the traits of your defenders. But to Cousy, it's more important to know the traits of his teammates. He's cataloged those in his mind. Out on the right wing, Sam Jones, like a bolt of lightning. In the left wing, Havlicek, always in motion. Trailing is Tommy Heinsohn. They're all dependable finishers on the break. But Kuz has noted a telling detail. When Russ gets the rebound, his chin tilts downward, almost to his chest. And that's a sign that the big man's coming. And when the big man runs all 94 feet, he will be rewarded. So Kuzi knows that in almost all, in no time at all, Russell is going to be past Heinsohn, and he is going to be into the front court. Heinsohn would say that he sees Russell runs by him, and it's like watching the, the highway patrol car on the chase. So Coos pulls back on the throttle, just slightly, pulls back to the right in the front court. Sam Jones peels out to the right wing, Havlicek to the left, Heinsohn slows, and here comes Russell. Coos throws that arcing pass, always to the left side, because Russell's left-handed, to strong side and he finishes the break, sometimes with a slam, sometimes just lays it in. Now, there, standing at the bench, is our back. Program usually rolled up in his hands. He adores the fast break. He wants to punish opposing teams with the transition game, and he will. Our back, our back is, is raised in Brooklyn, his father a dry cleaner, Jewish man from the old world. He's in, our back is intense, hyper-competitive. He spews lava on referees. They hate him, and he hates them. Late in the game, Celtics ahead now, and Auerbach, through intimidation and manipulation, has worked his way inside the heads of his own men, inside the heads of the opposing coach and his men, inside the heads of the referees, who remember, they hate him even inside the head of the shot clock operator. When he pulls out that victory cigar to, to signify that a Celtics victory is well in hand, 
He's going to work his head inside the, the fan rooting for the opposing team, every one of them inside the arena. It's no wonder that by the end of Red Auerbach's career, fans across the league will have thrown at him a beer can, a lighted cigar, rotten tomatoes, eggs, paper hatchets, snowballs, women's handbags, and peanuts still in their shells. This was the Boston Celtics, your Boston Celtics, circa 1960. You know, the Lakers like to talk about their showtime, that fast break of the 80s and into the 90s. Listen, the Cousy Russell Celtics were running showtime 20 years before that. Lakers like to talk about their dynasties and three-peat. Consider this, in the fall of 1966, those Celtics with eight straight NBA championships were going for a nine-peat. Those Celtics between 1957 and 69 won 11 NBA championships in a 13-year period. Statistically, that makes this team America's greatest professional sports dynasty of the 20th century. And at the center were Kuz and Russ. Kuzi is an old man now. He's 90, a widower, living alone in a big house in Worcester, a house that's filled with memories and echoes. He reads a lot, about four hours a day. He's introspective. He thinks about his life. I've spent a lot of time interviewing, and you know, Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. More than two and a half years, I listened as Kuzi cataloged his life, people, moments. It's been a deep self-examination. And here's what I've learned from Kuzi, that examining our own lives gives us greater clarity, meaning, and purpose. It helps us fine-tune our ethical and moral compass. It helps us understand who we are and who we aspire to be. Kuzi has regrets. We all do. From Kuzi, we learn that we should ask ourselves, could I have done more or better? If the answer is yes, Kuzi's example shows us we should address that regret head on. And that's the simplicity and the power of Kuzi self-examination. Now, I wear this ring on my right hand, which is part of my continuing self-examination. My father gave this ring to me after he had worn it for 30 years. It was his father's ring, uh, and it carries my grandfather's initials, double P, for Philip Pomerantz. My dad gave me this ring inside a ring box in 1998, almost exactly 20 years ago to the day, when the two of us were on our family pilgrimage to the old world in what is now Kremenchuk, Ukraine. Grandpa's world in what was then old world Russia. Now my grandfather fled the Tsar in 1912. Grandpa was Jewish and in Russia 1912, that was not a good time or place to be that. He was bar mitzvahed on the boat as it made its passage through Ellis Island. So this ring gives me strength and, and a sense of clarity. It's my guidepost. It tells me who I am, where I've been. Kuzi has a different sort of guidepost now. It isn't a ring. It isn't even an object. It's a man, his greatest teammate, Russell. Russell is 84 now, and he has lived an epic life. He won five Most Valuable Player Awards, and when he saw racial injustice in the 1960s, he called it out. Russell is a man of great intellect, pride, humor, sensitivity, and he likes to say it is more important to understand than to be understood. And it's as if he threw that cloak of mystery over himself. Auerbach once said, the real Russell is a very difficult man to know, but one worth knowing. And I'm certain that's true. In Kuzi's deep self-examination over these past few years, Russell has become almost like a mirror. In looking to Russell, Kuzi, as a 90-year-old man, now sees a reflection of himself. He sees the things he said and did as captain of the Celtics that storied dynasty, as well as the things he did not say or do. And it's the latter that eats at his conscience and stirs his regrets. The hallmarks of the six books I've done, all of them nonfiction, are history, sports, 
and race. My last book was about a great football dynasty, the Pittsburgh Steelers of the 1970s. Terry Bradshaw, Mean Joe Green, Franco Harris. That book really examined football's gifts and, and costs. And as I considered my next book topic, and coming up with the next book idea is, is treacherous footing for me at the very least, I, I was thinking about other great dynasties I might write about. Baseball, I thought about the New York Yankees of the 20s or the 40s or 50s. Then I thought about basketball. Well, the Boston Celtics, of course, of the 50s and 60s among dynasties, it doesn't get any better. The Celtics had nine Hall of Famers. Think about that. Nine Hall of Famers on one team. That's almost two units. And I realized that unlike the Yankees of the 20s, 40s, and 50s, most of those players had died, most of the Celtics were still around and at least, in theory, available to be interviewed. So I decided to pursue that Celtics dynasty. That at least was my concept until my first interview with Kuzi at his house. That changed my narrative focus. That changed everything. Here's what happened. Flew to Boston and I drove to Worcester. Knocked on the front door. Door opens and there stands an 87-year-old man holding a wooden cane in his left hand and extending his right hand to shake mine. That, that cane, I later learned, had been given to him by a fan who had thought to burn into the handle four letters, C-O-O-Z, Goose, one of his nicknames. That day, we shared a four-hour interview. I ask a lot of questions, but even for me, that's a long interview. Kuzi lives by himself in a 6,300-square-foot house that he and his wife, Missy, bought in 1963, the last year he played for the Celtics, the last year of the Kennedy administration. The Kuzis were married nearly, nearly 63 years, and Missy died in 2013 after spending the last decade and more with dementia. Bob Cousy tended to her every need. He says their marriage was unusual in that the last 20 years were the most romantic. Friends would say Bob and Missy during those years held their hands wherever they went, even from the living room to the kitchen. There's a pastel portrait of Missy on the dining room wall. And Coos talks to it as if Missy is still there. Love you, sweetheart, he'll say. I'm afraid you're stuck with me all day today. In that first interview, Coosey laughed as he told old Celtic stories. He wept openly about Missy. And once he stood balancing his cane to demonstrate a dribbling move. He was funny, self-deprecating, introspective, emotional, and intense. He was all in, same as he was on the court with the Celtics. It quickly became clear to me that Cousy had much on his mind and in his heart, and that he had no small amount of regret about his relationship as teammate of Bill Russell. Cousy wishes he had not remained silent. He wishes he had spoken out publicly about the prejudice Russell faced in Boston and around the NBA. He wishes that as Celtics captain, and Cousy was captain all 13 of his seasons in Boston, he wishes he pulled Russell aside privately and said, Russ, I've got your back. He knows whatever he said publicly, Boston's white sports writers would have printed because they always printed what he said. But he did not do that. He did not say that. In Boston, a city with a fraught history of race relations, there would have been personal risk for Cousy to stand up publicly in those years between 1957 and 1963, to stand up publicly for an African-American teammate. And now he believes that was a risk worth taking. He now says, I might have been able to neutralize some of this if I had been more outspoken. In that same first interview, he said, I guess at this point in life, you get more introspective. What's it all about? What am I doing here? Is there a God out there? He talked about one day going to the big basketball court in the sky. My time, Cousy said, is limited. And so after that first interview, I made the decision to, that the story to tell was Cousy's. I understood that the, that the continuing story of that great Celtic dynasty 
played on, not on the parquet floor of, of Boston Garden, but in the conscience of the captain. Over the ensuing two and a half years, I conducted 52 more interviews with Cousy. Total of 53 interviews. 53, I mean, I never interviewed anyone that many times before. I interviewed him at his house in Worcester, sometimes out in the back, in an enclosed back patio, sometimes in the living room. I interviewed him at his condo in uh, South Florida. I interviewed him by phone, and we would talk every few weeks. Sometimes he would drop me a note in the mail. Other times he left messages on my answering machine. He'd say, it's old number 14 calling. He'd been thinking, he said, about our last interview. And he had more to say. And usually the topic he wanted to discuss was race and Russell. Kuzi has become kind of like basketball's Alexander Hamilton, the forgotten founding father. I mean, Hamilton wrote the Federalist Papers. He created our national banking system. Um, but until the brilliant stage play that carries his name, old Alexander Hamilton was lost to time. And in basketball lore, the way it's remembered, the way it's told, that has been Cousy's fate, too, lost to time. His, his basketball legacy is is outsized. It is large. He has had an enormous systemic effect on the NBA, a founding father kind of effect. Foremost, his theatricality and his innovation on the court as a bold and daring point guard. Back in the 50s, he was like Elvis or James Dean, a renegade dismissive of the, of, of the, the game's conservative values and culture. He dribbled behind his back when no one else did. He threw no-look passes, look this way, pass that way, when no one else did. Today, and I want the guys on the basketball team to hear this, today in every Steph Curry crossover dribble, in every Russell Westbrook no-look pass, in every imaginative, imaginative move that Kyrie Irving makes, there is a little bit of koozie. Those stylistic touches all flow historically through koozie. The beauty of today's NBA is, is the aesthetics, the gorgeous movements as if set to jazz music, and also in the creative imagination of the men who play the game. And in this regard, Cousy lives in the soul of today's game. As a player, he won six NBA titles. He made 13 All-Star games. He won an MVP award. He led the league in assists for eight straight seasons. And he did so much more. He founded the Players Union during the 50s. Consider this, Kuzi in his last year with the Celtics made $35,000. Last year, Steph Curry and LeBron James made $35 million. So the decimal point has moved three places to the right. Kuzi and Auerbach made several trips across the globe during the 1950s to Europe, to Asia, to Africa, sponsored by the U.S. State Department, promoting the game of basketball. They met Secretary of State John Foster Dulles before one trip. And as basketball ambassadors in these foreign lands, they gave clinics, demonstrations, they showed films of the Celtics fast break. Last year, to tell you the kind of fruits that this bore, these trips, 108 players from 42 foreign nations and territories made NBA opening night rosters. Kuzi room with the first African-American player ever drafted into the NBA, Chuck Cooper of Duquesne. And they became great friends. They were roommates as rookies in 1950, only three years after Jackie Robinson had integrated baseball. Cousy coached in the NBA. As many of you know, he was a broadcaster of the Celtics for 34 years. He was named among the NBA's 50 greatest players in 1981, or 71, 81, and 96. I mean, few players have had this effect, and now he's 90. Now he's closing circles with the people who matter to him most, first with Missy, then their two grown daughters. In 2003, Cousy decided to sell all his basketball memorabilia, all the plaques and trophies and scrapbooks, uh, and he wanted to give and did give the proceeds to his two grown daughters, both retired educators. The Cousy collection netted in auction $450,000, grossed, I should say, including $25,000 for a photo of uh, President Kennedy in the Oval Office with the, 
with the uh, Celtics, that from 1963, and JFK had personally inscribed that to Cousy. So he had one more circle to close. And on his end of life to-do list, at the very top, William Felton Russell. So why Bill Russell? Why does Cousy, why does it matter so much to him? They were only teammates for seven years out of Cousy's 90. But as Cousy will tell you, those weren't just any seven years. They won six NBA championships during that time. And Russell wasn't just any man. So as I continued my interviews with Cousy in 2015, 16, 17, he watched compelling stories about race, flashpoints, play on his TV screen at home in Worcester. Trayvon Martin, Eric Garner, Tamir Rice, Ferguson, The Rise of Black Lives Matter. Cousy read the book Between the World and Me by Ta-Nehisi Coates, a searing tale about race in America, and with him, it landed hard. And any time Bob Cousy thinks about race, he thinks of Russell. Cousy and Russ were never close. They never really approached true friendship. When they talked in the locker room, it was usually about the game, our back, the usual team banner. They never spoke about their personal lives, never really spoke about civil rights. The truth is their wives were much closer friends than they were. But on the court, Kuz and Russ were magic. Russell blocked the shots and rebounded. Kuzi uh, dribbled and passed with high style. They were both murderously competitive. And Russell was rare among athletes of his time, in fact, athletes of any time. Like Muhammad Ali, like football's Jim Brown, Russell spoke out. He spoke his mind. He said the NBA had a quota system, and he was right about that, that limited opportunities for African-American players in the league. He engaged in the black freedom struggle. He led a civil rights march to Boston Common, and when the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. delivered the March on Washington Address in the summer of 63. There was Russell sitting in the front row. Russell faced the blast furnace heat of racism. In St. Louis, fans taunted him, screaming, gorilla, black baboon. In the Boston suburb of Reading, where Russell and his young family lived, police eyed Russell suspiciously as he drove through town. Vandals broke into his house several times. Once they smashed his trophy case and painted racist graffiti on the wall and defecated on his bed. I repeat, defecated on his bed. Russell certainly had hard feelings about Boston. In 1979, in his second memoir, he called Boston a flea market of racism. In those years between 1957 and 63, when Russell and Cousy were teammates, the white sports writers in Boston, and for the dailies, they were all white, they called it Cousy's team. It wasn't, unless it was Cousy's team and Russell's sport. You better hustle now that you don't have Cousy to carry you. That's what a white Celtic fan said to Bill Russell after Cousy retired in 1963, and it made Russell wonder does this fan not know that I've been the MVP for the last three years? History, as we know, has since revised that perspective. Now this dynasty is viewed properly as Russell's team, and Cousy knows what happened. Reality happened, he said. So I asked Cousy about how race had shaped Russell's life and his. And Cousy said that if he, Cousy, had been African American, he said he would not have been perceived as an innovative player. More likely, he said, the league's response to his Houdini style during the 1950s would have been, that fancy black stuff will never work at this level. And he says if Russell had been white, maybe they would have named a bridge after him, like they did a tunnel for Ted Williams. Nearly a half century later, Barack Obama in 2011, awarded Russell the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor, sometimes likened to American knighthood. And with it, Russell had won the historical narrative of the Celtics dynasty. In 2001, Cousy sat for an interview at his house in Worcester with ESPN. They were doing a special on Russell being named one of the athletes of the 20th century, one of the greatest. And he spoke easily 
about Russell's athletic greatness. But then Cousy was asked about race, and he started to say he should have reached out to Russell. But as he, as he said this, his emotions surged, and he tried to maintain, maintain self-control. He broke down weeping, burying his head in his hands. The camera held this scene for several powerful moments. It made for good TV, for sure. A few months later, and this is 2001, Cousy and Russell met by chance at a celebrity golf tournament in Southern California. Russ saw Coos having breakfast alone in the hotel restaurant. And, and whenever Cousy sees Russell, he's never sure if he's going to get an embrace or a glower. But now Russell came over and embraced him and sat down at the table with Cousy. And Coos heard Russ say that he knew about the ESPN interview. He heard Russ say that there was nothing Cousy could have done as a teammate to make life easier for him. Russell talked for some time. Cousy had much that he wanted to say, like, Russ, we should have the same relationship that I've had with, with Satch Sanders, where I f feel free to call him and say, come on, let's go to dinner together. But Cousy did not say that. He listened. He knew that Russell was trying to make him feel better. He felt his guilt diminish, and he, and he hoped it would lead to a new, improved relationship. But it did not. So the captain has had time to reflect and reconsider. It is rare for a 90-year-old white man in America to rethink race and how it played out in his life. But that's what Cousy has done and is still doing. He vividly remembers a moment of racial solidarity on the Celtics in February 1952. Not with Russell, but with Chuck Cooper. As you'll recall, the first African-American player drafted by the Celtics or any NBA team. The Celtics defeated Rochester in a game at a neutral site, Raleigh, North Carolina. And after the game, Cooper discovered he would not be able to, to lodge at the same hotel as, as his white teammates because of segregation. So he told Auerbach, I'll just take the late night sleeper car train back to New York, and when you guys fly there tomorrow, I'll just meet you. Cousy heard about it and asked Auerbach if he could join Cooper on that sleeper train, and Auerbach agreed to it. So as the two Celtics, Cousy and Cooper, waited at the deserted Raleigh train station post midnight in the darkness, they had a few beers, and they walked to the restroom or I should say restrooms, because there they found the signs, white, colored. Cousy was raised in poverty in New York, had read about this, but had never seen it. And he fumbled for words to ease Cooper's discomfort, and Cousy felt embarrassed. He told me he felt embarrassed to be white. The two men had an idea. With sly grins, they walked from the bathrooms to the far end of that railroad platform outside. They looked around to see if anybody was watching. No one was there. And then, in an act of brotherhood, they unzipped their flies, and side by side, they relieved themselves from the platform. To Cousy, this defiance of segregation felt good and right. It was our Rosa Parks moment, he says, that we couldn't talk about. You know, most star athletes, when they grow old, they embellish and burnish their stories that they tell about themselves. In a profile of the retired baseball star Joe DiMaggio in Esquire magazine in 1966, writer Gay Talese wrote, the baseball hero must always act the part, must preserve the myth, and none does that better than DiMaggio. Cousy is not doing that. He recognizes his flaws. He's admitting them, even drawing attention to them. He's not gilding any lilies. He's not embellishing any truths. He's trying to set the record straight. This is who I was. And here is his final declaration. I wish I'd done more. We talked about all of this during our interviews. No, Cousy would not make his last stand with Russell on the phone. He would do it by writing a letter in February 2016. A mea culpa, an apology that was the product of his self-examination. And that is the letter that I refer to 
with the book's title, The Last Pass. One more detail before I finish here. There is a desk clock in Cousy's dining room. It was a gift from Bill Russell and his wife, Rose, to the Cousy, to the Cousy's when Bob Cousy retired in 1963. And I saw it in Cousy's house. And I noticed that the, this clock is engraved with words that speak warmly of friendship. Here's what it says. May the next 70 years be as pleasant as the last seven, from the, Cous uh, from the Russells to the Cousies. Seventy years must have seemed like an eternity to Russ then, but now 55 of those years have passed. Missy and Rose are gone. The clock's batteries died long ago. At the age of 90, this much Bob Cousy knows. Time is long and time is short. Thank you very much. Yeah, I've read uh, three books uh, on uh, uh, Cousy's uh, biographies, and yours is the fourth one that I've read. And as you mentioned, the 53 interviews uh, is, is remarkable because in uh, reading your book, I was struck by the similarities that referenced by uh, a sports writer by name, Alan Hirschberg. And uh, this uh, happened decades ago, and he said uh, uh, in it about Cousy's personality, Cousy is not a man to make friends easily. If he is talking basketball, he talks well, but he has to be drawn out. Words do not come easily to him. He also has a vague air of independence, a severe indifference to what other people think of him, and a suspicion of strangers which is only eliminated after he is certain that their intentions toward him are honorable. Why did he open up to you? Well, it, it took a little time for him to open up, but I think he, he found it cathartic. I, I think he had a lot that he wanted to say. He really was thinking deeply about his life. And he, he's always been an introspective guy. Bill Russell, too, they share that. Um, and. Uh, you know, he could be crotchety at times, but I could tell he liked it. Mm. I could tell that he wanted to process this. You know, when we're young, we aspire to be a great man. But Cousy's now got a little age on him, mm -hmm. more than a little, and, and he is um, a little more context and wisdom. He realizes life is not eternal, and I think he aspires to be a good man. And, and um, all of that is wrapped up into this. He certainly is a wonderful man. And uh, two years ago, uh, I had the opportunity to go up to the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, and we had some extra tickets. And I called Cousy and asked him if he wanted to come along. And we had hotel rooms for him. Uh, but he called back and he said, uh, you know, I'm just not up to it uh, for, for doing the traveling. And then he called back the next day and he kind of felt guilty. And uh, uh, I said to him, Coach, you don't need to feel guilty. And he said, no, I want to invite you and the group uh, to come to my home. And uh, Coach Lydon, uh, you were there as well. And we went into the home and he welcomed us. And uh, you mentioned about uh, a Missy uh, with uh, you know, the, the dementia for the last uh, 10 years. And there's a wonderful article if you go online by uh, Diane Williamson at the, uh, the Worcester Telegram uh, of love. Uh, uh, and she talks about Cousy, uh, how he was so close to her. But there's a photo, uh, not a photo, a painting there. But uh, tell us a little bit about the painting. Well, 1963 was Bob Cousy Day. It was uh, the so-called Boston Tear Party because all of New England cried. Um, it said the most hard-hearted men in Boston cried twice in 1963. Once in March when Bob Cousy retired and once in November when President Kennedy was assassinated. Um, Cousy was a big name in this town. I think the, the four biggest names in Boston at that time were Cardinal Cushing, John Kennedy, Ted Williams, and Bob Cousy. Um, and 
he got a lot of gifts, as it usually happens on Bob Cousy Day. And, and one of them was given by the New York Knicks. It's a portrait about this big of Missy, Missy a pastel. And it, it hangs in the dining room. And he talks to it all the time. And Cousy likes to say that his rule is one life, one wife. <laughs> and and it's, it's kind of sweet and gentle, you know, to see him uh, this way with uh, with her memory. He he thinks and talks about her often. Mm -hmm. And you're absolutely right because uh, when we walked into uh, his home uh, that day, he said, Jim, uh, come on over here. Uh, there's something I want to show you. And that's the first thing he did uh, was show me that photo. And here's the program uh, for that uh, April 27, 1963, on that retirement uh, uh, time uh, for, for Bob Cousy. And there's a story that uh, Dolph Shays uh, uh, relayed uh, on that. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with it, uh, but uh, Shays, uh, they were playing Shays' of Syracuse Nationals that, uh, uh, that day of the Cousy retirement. And uh, Shays uh, tells the story that there was Cousy crying. He's a very emotional person, as you know. His daughters was crying, his teammates were crying, and then Shea said, I looked over and there were the referees crying. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew we were in trouble for the game coming up uh, uh, at that point. <laughs> Can I borrow this for a second? This is an ad that Bob Cousy did with other sports stars for, I'll hold it up a little higher so everyone can see, for Jansen uh, apparel in, in, in the early 1960s. That's Cousy sitting atop a surfboard. This is w the spoils of what it meant to be a white superstar in sports in the early 1960s. At about this same time, Bill Russell, thank you, who had won several uh, MVP awards, well, I was actually in this, yeah, three he had won at this point, uh, in the summer of 1962, drove his, two of his young children home to the south to Louisiana. And uh, he heard them crying out to him in the back seat. Daddy, I'm hungry. Daddy, can we get food? Daddy, can we stop somewhere? I'm tired. I want to go to sleep. And because of segregation, he couldn't find any of these places. That's what it meant to be uh, an African-American superstar. Those were the spoils uh, in that time period. And this is, this is important contextual material to, to understand this relationship. It did not happen in a vacuum. Nothing happens in a vacuum. I'm going to open this up in a moment to, to our audience because I'm sure they'll have uh, many questions. And uh, I've certainly found the book uh, fascinating. And one thing that Cousy revealed an awful lot to you that he does never uh, reveal to other individuals. And some of it had to do with his mother and his father and the fact that he had a half-sister. He's always been reported out that he was an only child. But tell us a little bit about that. Well, um, Bob Cousy, his parents came to this country in 1927 from France on the Mauritania. And his mother was already pregnant with Bob Cousy. He likes to say he was fabricated in France. <laughs> and uh, it was a hard living, a hard life for the family, growing up in poverty, in tenement house poverty in Manhattan. and. Uh, his mother and father, as I say, were French. His mother hated anyone or anything German. Now, unfortunately for her husband, Joe Cousy, he happened to live at a time when, well, following the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, Germany annexed the Alsatian region. And that's where Joe Cousy lived and grew up. And so, though he was speaking French, thinking French, being French, he was technically German. And when, guess what? World War I happens, and he's conscripted into the, into the Prussian army. Cousy, you know, when you interview somebody a lot of time, uh, you, you, when they get interviewed a lot of times, you can tell because their answers are burnished, and they're, it's almost by rote. They've told the story so many times. But when I started asking Bob Cousy about his parents, we were deviating from the usual course. I could tell because there were long pauses. 
everything wasn't scripted in advance. And he told me the stories about how his mother used to call anyone she didn't like, Sal Bosch, dirty German. And many times, she turned that on her husband, Joe Cousy. And Bob Cousy told me he remembered as a child hearing his mother scream at his father, Sal Bosch, and then smack him hard in the head. Happened more than a few times. And I said, uh, what did your dad do when that happened? And the pause was long, and Cousy's looking across the living room, looking across time, and he said, he didn't do anything. He just sat there and took it. So he grows up in a home where he recognizes prejudice, his mother's. And then he goes to school at Holy Cross, and he learns from the Jesuits about this humanistic approach to life, which he would embrace and which would effectively change him. His la in, for his senior thesis in 1949-50, just after World War II, his, his topic was the persecution of minority groups. And he focused on anti-Semitism you know, following the Holocaust. So there are signs all across his life that he's thinking and thinking deeply about prejudice. I had the, a, a conversation about Cousy, as you mentioned, about uh, you know, the, the mother, Juliet, uh, physically uh, you know, slapping him, uh, the father. And at one point, the father said, I'm going out to get some bread. And what happened? He went out to get bread and was gone almost four years. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and, uh, and step, that which, step, the which brings us back to, yes, his, he, his, his father had been married once before um, and his, uh, in France, and his wife died during World War I. And the subject of that wife was verboten. <laughs> it, she would not be discussed in the Cousy household. And, and one night at dinner, Cousy's father says he's going out to get a loaf of bread, and he leaves, and he goes to Riverhead on Long Island, and there he lived with his daughter from his first marriage for several years. A quick postscript to that story. They both kept asking Cousy about the other, because they were, uh, Cousy's father came to live with him when he coached in Cincinnati in the 1970s. And uh, Cousy would try to play Cupid. He'd say, Dad, Mom just called. She was asking about you. And he would say, No, she didn't. He'd say, Mom, I just talked to Dad. He was asking about you. She, he, no, he didn't. Well, Cousy was driving through New York on the way back to Worcester. And again, this is in the 70s. And they stop off there. Now, his father has not seen his mom since he went out to get a loaf of bread. So Cousy says they walk in. And when they walk in, Juliet, his mom, is, is sort of bent over the oven, taking something out of the oven. And I said, well, what did your father say? And he said, my dad walked in and said, so, what's for dinner? <laughs> <laughs> when I told the, the speaking to Cousy about that, I said, you know, Coach, what the father, uh, uh, the mother should have said was, where's the bread? Yeah. <laughs> well, they ended up, by the way, that night, Cousy <laughs> saw his parents sitting on the couch later, and they were holding hands. Mm -hmm. And Cousy said, Dad, come on, we got to go. And his father just said, get my bag. I'll be staying a while. And he said in a very short time, though, it was back to Sal Bosch. And, you know. <laughs> you know, and, and one of the interesting things uh, about uh, Sal Bosch, a dirty German, was uh, that uh, Missy's last name is? Ritter Bush. <laughs> Cousy knew his mother and wife wouldn't get along from the first moment. He dreaded coming home and introducing um, his mother to his soon-to-be wife, whose last name was a German name, Ritterbush. So, was... and, and Juliet was a, a very strong personality, uh, as is evidenced uh, when uh, Cousy was playing a game against the Knicks in Madison Square Garden, and uh, he got knocked down. He was dizzy on it, 
And the next thing he remembered, looking up, and there was our back, Buddy LaRue, the trainer, and his mother on the court. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for those of you who had a parochial education or a Catholic education, Cousy looked up and he said, Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, Mom, <laughs> get back in the stands on that. And at that point, uh, he didn't invite her anymore. That's it. She got no more free tickets. <laughs> but let's, uh, let's open it up uh, to uh, our audience here uh, for, for some questions. Please. The topic said what it was going to be, but it didn't say anything about the depth and extraordinary piece of what it's going to be. And I've got to thank you for that. Um, well, thank you for those kind words. Very nice of you to I, say. I was, I'm 76 years old, so I grew up with coups. But I would like to, so these people who aren't my age yeah. might get a sense of how people felt about Cousy here. Where that program at the retirement, there were four words that were shouted out. And I didn't know about the people on the court or the referees, but there were 13,909 people that were crying that moment. Would you repeat those words? Sure. It was uh, a 32-year-old water district worker named Joe Dillon from Southie. At a moment when Kuzi was breaking down, crying as he's addressing the crowd, it's quiet momentarily. And Dillon from the upper balcony on the Causeway Street side yells, We love you, Kuz! And it just brought down the house with cheers. And Missy came over to him and handed him... <laughs> Uh, handkerchief, and it gave Cousy enough time to, to sort of regain his composure and, and carry on. So yeah, that was a big moment. And just for another piece of him, there was a time when hockey was king and basketball was not king. So when the, before the parquet could be laid on the ice, when there was a basketball game on the same day there was a a Bruins game. They played at the Walter Brown Arena at um, Northeastern. And it was an intimate place. Now, Cousy hated the referees just the way that you <laughs> described. But it was intimate enough so you could hear an interchange between Cousy and the referees. And the one he hated the most was Mendy Rudolph. And he had a bit of a speech impediment, which got better over the years. But he was my hero, this great hero. And I heard him go up to Mendy Rudolph and s complaining about something. And this is what he said. Listen here, Wefflewee. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, so wait, I have to say something about that. Everybody mimics Cousy as if he's Elmer Fudd. He doesn't turn, let's see, R's into W's. He turns R's into L's. So like when I would hear him call, he would say, Galli Pomelance, you know, and it was, but yeah, he sort of, he was likened to the, being the, the Barbara Walters of Celtics telecast for a while. I want to thank you both for a really great presentation. Uh, we've heard for decades now uh, uh, Russell's complaints about uh, discrimination as he went to other cities in, yeah. uh, in the South and uh, all the events you, uh, you mentioned in Reading and things, stuff that happened to him. My question is, what did you discover about racism on the team or in the Celtics organization? Well, let's see. I, I conducted, I think in the end, about 150 interviews for this book, 53 of them, of course, um, with Bob Cousy. I did not get to interview Bill Russell. Uh, Bill Russell, I know when you can get him to sit down for an interview is a pretty fantastic interview subject. Like Cousy, he's introspective and he's an intellectual guy. Um, I interviewed Heinsohn a few times and Havlicek and uh, Willie Knowles and Satch Sanders. Um, I had interviewed Red Auerbach back in 2003 for an earlier book I did, which was actually also about the NBA in this period. It was about Will Chamberlain's 100-point game. And people would say, you did a whole book on a game? I said, well, not entirely on the game, but there was a lot going on uh, in America at that time. What I knew coming into the book from working on, uh, on that book was that um, black players and white players socially lived apart. 
the Celtics would get together, by the way, at Russell's house often for uh, Christmas parties, and Russell and his wife Rose often, always made sure to get presents for everybody, particularly the kids, um, usually for the players, bottle of cologne or tie. But other than that, they lived apart. But why would we expect anything more? Think about American life at that time. This was the heart of, you know, King's modern civil rights movement. There was hell breaking out all over the South. And um, what's somewhat miraculous is that, you know, this team came together across racial lines with shared ambitions and built a defining sports empire. No one on the team mentioned that another player was a racist, to answer your question directly. Um, Sat Sanders told me a story where they were in the locker room once and Russell came over to him and, and Frank Ramsey was sitting right next to him, Frank Ramsey from Kentucky. And he'd say, Frank, Frank, Russell says, or no, hey, I'm sorry, he says, Satch, don't look in, don't look in Ramsey's trunk. Don't do that. What do you mean? The hoods, the hoods, they're in there. They're, ba they're back in there. <laughs> <laughs> and Ramsey squealed. I can't repeat exactly here in polite company what he said, but uh, Russell has a great sense of humor, a famous laugh. Kuzi is worried that he's going to hear that laugh in the hereafter. Um, <laughs> This, this uh, Sports Illustrated, much to uh, the regret of my wife, I have sports, all the Sports Illustrateds, uh, <laughs> going back to the original Sports Illustrated uh, on that. But Cousy was the first NBA player uh, to be uh, on the, the cover of Sports Illustrated. But there's a little bit of a, a sidelight to, to it uh, of who was the first collegiate player to be on and it was a fellow by the name of Kenny Sears from Santa Clara, the same conference that Russell played in. And there's a little bit of a backstory about uh, Kenny Sears. Yes, well, Russell won two NCAA championships while at USF, University of San Francisco. And uh, he was the MVP of a Final Four in one of them. And when the sports writers covering that, their conference picked the most valuable player, they picked Kenny Sears. And Russell was enraged by the snub. And he later said that that was the moment when he decided he would never judge his career based on how many awards he received, but on how many championships uh, he won. I want to say one thing. Earlier this past week, last um, Tuesday, Bob Cousy and I went to the Celtics practice. Brad Stevens, the coach of the team, um, has said, has read my book and has said some very kind things about it. If you're going to have a publicist, he'd be, he's a good one to have. And um, we asked if Bob Cousy could come to see uh, the practice and maybe talk to the team. And Jeff Twiss of the Celtics, the publicist, fantastic publicist for the last 38 years, I think, forwarded me Brad's email. It just said, Bob Cousy is always, all caps, Welcome to a Celtics practice. And so we went and uh, we met the team in the film room, actually right before their practice. And, and I teach. Um, I teach at Stanford and I'm used to looking at students to see if they're with me, like I've been looking at all of you to see if you're with me or not. And I'm, I, I wasn't listening to Kuzi, who spoke for 20 or 25 minutes. I was just looking in the eyes of all the players and some of them were pretty wide-eyed. They were like, is this really Bob Cousy? You know, it was like Christmas past. Uh, and when it was done, Cousy got emotional a few times. He talked a lot about what it means to wear the jersey, um, how you shouldn't need to be um, motivated by a Newt Rockney speech, at which point Brad Stevens said, well, they know they're not going to get one of those from me. When he was done, the players formed a receiving line, almost as you would see at a wedding. And one by one, they just passed by Guzzi to shake his hand. When it was done, there was um, a one-on-one -on -one conversation between Kyrie Irving and Bob Guzzi. And, and um, this was for Celtics.com. It's for a video that's not yet been put on the site, but will be soon, I'm told. And I just sat in and watched it. And I have to say, it was amazing. You know, this was like watching two um, 
artists talk about their, what it is they do as point guards. And it was just a, a beautiful, multi-generational Celtics moment. It was pretty fantastic. Please. Hi, thank you Hello. very much for coming. This has been great. I heard you and Mr. Cousy on NPR over the weekend, which was also wonderful. And in it, uh, you mentioned, or he mentioned the, the letter that he sent a couple of years ago now yeah. uh, to uh, Bill Russell. And he mentioned that I think just recently, Bill Russell uh, phoned him. And I wonder if you could provide any more insight on that conversation. Spoiler alert. All right, I'll tell you. Mm. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so, so the letter was sent February 2016, and uh, no response came for six months, for a year, a year and a half, two years, two and a half years later, just two months ago, in the middle of August, um, at about 7.30 on a Sunday night, Bob Cousy's phone rings, and he's got caller ID, he looks down and he sees it's coming from Seattle. One of his daughters lives in Seattle, but it wasn't the same number. And uh, he picked up, said hello, and he heard a very old, uh, soft, enfeebled voice say, Bob, it's Bill Russell calling. I'm calling to see how you're doing. Um, there were others in the Celtics' inner circle who had learned about Cousy's letter to Russell. Um, and, and one or two were urging him to call Bob. And they ended up talking for about 10 or 12 minutes. Um, Cousy said he did almost all the talking. He said, Russ's hearing isn't great. And there were long pauses. They talked about the recent death of their teammate, Frank Ramsey, at 86. They talked about a little bit about Russell's travels to various NBA events and games. And then Cousy said, Russ, I sent you a letter uh, a few years ago. Did you ever get that? And Russell said, yes, I did. But he said nothing more about the letter. And Cousy said, well, I, I enclosed a book, too, between the world and me. Did you, did you get that? And Russell said, I did, but I haven't read it yet. They talked for another few minutes. And, and Cousy said he got, felt a little emotional. But he, he said, Russ, thank you for calling, my friend. It's, it's good to hear from you. And the conversation ended. I told Cousy, if Russell calls you, let me know about it quick because I'm getting close to my publication time. And, and so he let me know the next morning. I know he appreciated that call uh, more than a little. I also know that he had achieved his inner peace on this subject with the writing of the letter. Hi, I'm Jim Kilpatrick. Thank you so much. This has been... So exciting for me because I followed the Celtics as a in high school, and I lived in Southern California at the time. They were my I, I'm a Bostonian, so it, Russell in particular meant a tremendous amount to me. So I was wondering. I mean, I it's my personal belief that Russell's the greatest basketball player ever, and that he would hold his own against LeBron and Jordan, all those figures, because of his incredible ability to do defense. It was just and I wonder if, if Cousy ever talked about that uniqueness, the way he could block a shot but, but, and also hold on to it and get a, you know, as, as you were showing earlier, getting a fast break going, what was it, 40 rebounds in one uh, uh, playoff game, things like that. Does he, did uh, he ever talk about that aspect of his relationship with, uh, with Russell? Oh, yes, he did. He talked a lot about Russell on the court. Um, the thing about Russell as a defensive player is he didn't just block shots. He put a trauma on opposing shooters. And by that, I mean, it wasn't just that these shooters and their confidence, you know, were wrecked for the rest of the game. It lasted several games. They'd be playing two and three more games against teams that didn't have Bill Russell on them. And they would fear Russell was coming out of the shadows from the side to block their shot. He was that dramatic uh, as a shot blocker. I mean, he did for defense uh, in basketball what Babe Ruth did uh, for offense with the home run in the 1920s for, uh, for baseball. Cousy loves to talk about 
Russell as a basketball player, his great skill sets, the way he ran the floor. Um, you know, I asked him at one point, who do you think are the five best players in basketball history? And as I recall, the first name is Russell. Um, he mentioned um, LeBron, Michael Jordan, and um, Oscar Robertson. That's only four. I said, well, who's the fifth? And he thought about it and he said, I don't know, I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> so typical Kuzi, the next morning he gets up, takes out the sheet of paper and his pen, and writes me a full page letter with his top 15 players, three at each position. But these were his best players from 1950 to 2000. He wasn't including modern players because he said, I just don't think I've seen them enough. But, you know, he's, he's very high on LeBron for sure. He says LeBron is the greatest player ever. Um, and he talked about LeBron's ability to play all five positions on the floor and, and so forth. But he, he is, uh, his mind is still so sharp. It's like a basketball library of Congress. I mean, he's got it cataloged and he's, he's remarkable in that way. Jim, your question is an interesting one about uh, Russell blocking shots. Uh, uh, because I recall, and this goes back quite a ways ago for those of you with some vintage on it, there was a great player for the Philadelphia Warriors, as they were known back then, called Neil Johnston, who had a, a terrific hook shot, but it was kind of a flat shot. And uh, Russell would block that shot. But there were times that J he would let Johnston shoot the shot. And people were a little betwixt by it. And they asked him, well, why, Russell, uh, why are you not blocking a shot every time? He said, because Johnson is a smart man. If I blocked a shot every time, he'd come up with something different. <laughs> I waited to the fourth quarter. Yeah. And that's when I would block his shot, when the game was on the line. Let's go back to 1957. Russell comes uh, to the Celtics uh, in December because uh, he had participated in the Olympic Games in Melbourne, and we know that the seasons are reversed. So the winter games, uh, I should say the summer games, were in our winter. And uh, he shows up, uh, and the Celtics are already 19 and 8, I think, uh, at that time. And they go on to play the St. Louis Hawks in the championship, an incredible series. But at one instance uh, there, there in St. Louis, the owner, Ben Kerner, who Red Auerbach had coached uh, for before, Sharman thinks that the hoop is a little low. Tell us the story on that one. Well, Sharman was meticulous with his pregame regimen. He was um, very structured. And he was convinced that the basket was not quite right. It wasn't exactly 10 feet. And uh, he asked some of the guys on the team, and they said, yeah, 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 it's not right. So they told Auerbach, and Auerbach demanded it had to be remeasured. This is game three of the NBA Finals, 1957, Keeler Auditorium in St. Louis. And um, so they come out and measure it. And when Ben Kerner, the owner of uh, the St. Louis team, sees what's going on, he comes running out there, and he started to say, <laughs> to our back that you're a Bush leaguer and somewhere between Bush <laughs> and leaguer our back belted him in the mouth <laughs> he bloodied his lip a tooth came flying and the owners on the ground and said you can't even punch <laughs> can you imagine if that happens today like ESPN and Twitter they would just explode um, our, yeah our how, back. Much, how much did Maurice Podloff the commissioner fined Auerbach. I think it was $50. $300. Oh, $300. Okay. For con he called it conduct unbecoming. Uh. <laughs> what about the height? The height was correct. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. The height was exactly 10 feet. Yeah, it's interesting. Kerner is the man who agreed to trade Russell. I mean, it was an interesting trade. The rights to draft Bill Russell. Uh, with the second pick overall, another team picks uh, Hugo Green with the first pick. Um, and uh, it was an interesting trade because Kerner insisted on getting both Cliff Hagen and Ed McCauley, who be later became Hall of Famers. Yeah. 
in that same draft with Russell, uh, the Celtics got Tommy Heinsohn and Casey Jones. So there were five Hall of Famers involved in, in that move. By the way, when, when um, the, the Celtics came back in 157, in 58 they lost because Russell hurt, got hurt in game three of that series. That was the last all-white team to win an NBA title, and, and that was 1958, Russell's second season. Mm -hmm. And Ben Kerner would crow that this proved that the Russell trade was a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, you, you mentioned about uh, the, the next year, they're losing to uh, St. Louis. Uh, and I, I was doing a little research, and I came across a player uh, by the name of uh, Walter Buddy Davis. And Walter Buddy Davis is uh, unique in that he is the only athlete to win an Olympic gold medal in 1952 in Helsinki. He won the high jump. And then he came and he played the year before the Celtics won in 57. In 56, he won uh, the championship with Philadelphia. And then he was traded to St. Louis, and he was on that St. Louis team that beat the Celtics uh, the second year in 58. So I was, I, I was talking to Cousy, and I said, do you remember Walter Buddy Davis? And he said, I remember him. He said, uh, I, said I said, yeah, th they bookended you, uh, the two championships. Uh, uh, they won before you won in 57, and they won afterwards. And Cousy said, if Russell hadn't spr sprained his ankle, we would have won seven in a row with me, and we would have won 10 in a row. So Cousy had that you know, competitive instinct on that. And then he said, and Buddy Davis wasn't much of a basketball <laughs> player anyway. <laughs> Please, you have a question. Uh, yes, uh, it's fascinating. I'm really excited about reading your book. I was wondering where you said um, Bob Cousy wrote his thesis at Holy Cross on prejudice, whether he had an opportunity to probe his feelings about the modern athlete expressing a lot of views on a lot of these issues of the day, how, you know, Kareem Jebdebel, um, Kareem's book and the outspokenness on yeah. the national anthem, those kind of progressive issues of the day, how he felt about it, or did he share any of that with you? Yes, thank you for that question. I did talk with him about it, obviously, while we were working on the book. The Colin Kaepernick protests took off in the, in the NFL, and, and Cousy's with Kaepernick in, in speaking out on this. Where he diverts is the venue for it. You know, he's not sure that, in his view, that Kaepernick um, should be um, he should be doing it there. He thinks it would be uh, more effective without bringing down the team with him if he would call ESPN, let's say, and say, "Come to my house. I'm, I've got a statement to make," and do it there, not in uniform. Uh, I'll say this. For today's NFL players who are sympathetic or supportive of their African-American teammates' protests but are not saying or doing anything about it, Bob Cousy is a cautionary tale for them because I think they could become vulnerable to this same sort of regret years from now. We know in American life when the conscience bumps up against the wallet, the conscience doesn't often win. And, and there's all kinds of reasons for NFL players not to protest. I mean, most of the contracts are not guaranteed. Their careers are a little over three years on average. Um, they're not going to make the owners very happy. There's all kinds of pressures weighing in on them. But there is the price of regret and not answering to what you believe, you know, your conscience. So I, I think Cousy is a valuable lesson for them. They would, they would be well served by hearing his story. Um, I, I have a comment, and I'd like you to confirm it, hopefully, that uh, I'm one of uh, eight brothers and four sisters, and we listen to the Celtics, Bob, with, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, Johnny Most on the radio. We didn't have a television, so we listened to it all the time, but <clears throat> big, big fan, love them. But uh, my sister was a, a, a waitress in, um, uh, Framingham, Mass, and she at a place called Meadows, and Casey Jones, um, Sam Jones, I'm sorry, used to go there all the time. And she was waiting on him one night and said, my brothers love you guys. And so he comes in the next night, or the next time he arrived, 
with a basketball signed by all the Celtics. And it was 1965. And there, it was a one year, and I believe this is the question, that Red Albeck started an all black team, first in the NBA history, because Tommy Heinsohn was hurt and they had traded for or picked up a player. Willie Knowles. Willie Knowles, exactly. Yeah. And is that correct? Was he? It is correct. It is correct. Yes, it absolutely yeah. is correct. I, I mean, you. you know, Red would later be um, criticized decades later for always filling up his bench with white players because that's what, it, according to the criticism, that's what the white Celtic fans wanted to have. Um, the counterbalance to that is, you know, the Celtics were the, f the first NBA team to, to draft an African-American player, Chuck Cooper. They were the first team to start an all-black starting five, 1964. Yeah, uh, the fall of 64, I think. Um, and they hired the first uh, African-American coach, Bill Russell. So that's, that's impressive. Uh, Russell came in, obviously, a greater talent than Bob Cousy. Uh, was, was envy on Cousy's part part of his inability to speak out for Russell? It's a really interesting question. Uh, you don't get to be an athlete like Bill Russell or Bob Cousy without ego. And, you know, if I, I said earlier they were like the Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig of this dynasty, the truth is they both wanted to be Babe Ruth. You know, these were, uh, as I say, they were murderously competitive, and, and they were alphas who meant to lead. They wanted others to follow. And so, um, no, Cousy didn't say anything about that. But if you're asking me my view, yeah. I mean, I think these were, uh, there was an intramural competition going on there. Um, and, and that was all part of their relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Similar to that, uh, the other evening, Cousy was asked the question, how would the 1961 Celtics fare against today's you know, Golden State Warriors? Yeah, um, and what he said, I had asked him that question. He said, uh, we'd get their attention, and he paused. We'd make him shower after every game. <laughs> and then he paused. And then he said, well, this is what he said to me. He didn't say it exactly this way the other night. He said, I think they'd beat us in six. And whether that's true or not, whether that's true or not, it's, it's vintage koozie because he's not like most guys saying, oh, we clean their clocks. You know, we take them out. He doesn't, that's not his way. Who did he write the letter for? Yeah, I mean, he's very clear on that. He wrote the letter for himself. He wrote the letter for himself. He, he did it for Russell, too, but foremost, to answer to his own conscience. Um, that last piece of his end-of-life to-do list was, was to write this letter. And I think he hoped for a response, and he got a response, finally. But he had achieved his peace and answer to his conscience with the mere writing of the letter. I thought that was a magnanimous comment by him that he wrote it for himself. Uh, the others might have uh, said, no, I wrote it for Russell, but he's a truthful man. He is that. He's a great man. Thank you, Gary. Thanks, Jim. Enjoyed it immensely. Thank you.